Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Roll for Persuasion, your weekly show where I chat with creatives and entertainers about the nerdy things they do, the nerdy things they love, and how that uh, impacts their storytelling. I have a very nerdy creator with me here today, and I'm excited to chat with him in just a moment. But before we do, as always, I'd like to shout out some more nerdy people that I really love, and those are the uh, fine folks over at Hero Forge, purveyor, creator, supplier of the finest custom miniatures known to man, elf, beast, or otherwise. If you play tabletop games, even if you don't play tabletop games, if you just like making cool stuff, go to HeroForge.com and you can create, I mean, literally limitless combinations of the absolute perfect miniature for your game, for your desk, just to have as your own special friend, whatever you need it for, uh, Hero Forge can make it for you because they have literally an insane amount of options and combinations. You can paint these things digitally in color. They will actually print them in color and send them to you, uh, which is its own weirdness and amazingness. Um, I always mention that I, I literally do. I just have a plethora of them sitting in front of me at any given time because they're fantastic. We use them in all of our games. Big fans. So check them out at HeroForge.com. Follow their socials at HeroForge Minis on the different social places where people do things. Uh, Check them out. We appreciate their support of the show. And when you support them, you support us. So thanks. That's great. Speaking of nerdy things and nerdy guests, I hope you don't mind that I'm calling you nerdy, but that's just the intro for the show. So I think you just have to deal with it. I'm excited today. You got me all wrong, man. I'm I'm, I'm not a nerd. Yeah, I'm actually a super jock. I don't know if you can see in in the streaming video, but I'm actually wearing a Letterman jacket. I live to pound nerds, rip beers, and lift weights. You you don't have to be doing uh, burpees right now on stream, but I appreciate the commitment. Um, get that workout of the day in. in. Uh, that, of course, is the voice of the one and only Ross Bryan, improviser, artist, performer, writer. Uh, what don't you do? I mean, come to think of it, um, you do a bit oh. of everything. You are, uh, you're you're a performer on Jared Logan's Stream of Blood, um, which is how I first came across you. Not true. I saw an improv Shakespeare video on youtube many years ago and i think i actually probably saw you there but you're prolific you do a lot how's it going man oh yeah (laughs) we were talking before recording and i was like yes i'm like like probably a lot of people that you interview uh i have an annoying number of hyphens when i start when 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 someone asks me what i do because it's um it is a it is a jack of jack of many trades as 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 you kind of got to be nowadays you, you really do. And I feel like there needs to be a qualified process to decide like at what point you can add something to the hyphen. Cause like say the first time you uh, drunkenly record karaoke, are you now a singer? Like what is the cutoff for when, for when you can have a new title? I mean, if you go by social media rules, if you, if, if, if you've done it, you can throw it in that dang bio, baby. I always joke about on LinkedIn. Everybody is a CEO. Uh, yeah. Cause you just like click around. It's like, Oh, co-owner, CEO, founder. I'm like mm. entrepreneur, entrepreneur. Yeah. Mover and shaker, hashtag boss babe. Uh, anyway, man, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, I'm going to throw a curveball at you right Ooh. off the bat because no less than three previous guests of mine have mentioned you or have like had a response <laughs> when I, and I don't think any of them know you when I've mentioned <laughs> you. Uh, Too good. Uh, listening, you. various things is like, oh, Ross Bryant, he's, he's my improv crush. Or <laughs> Ross Bryant, oh, people in improv, they know that guy. Uh, in fact, I don't think any of them, I think I brought you up randomly because I mentioned stream of blood and somebody else was like, Oh, that Ross Bryant guy. So did you know that you are known in the underground improv circles as a, uh, a savant, if you will? Oh God, that's, that, well, that's very, that's add that very, to your hyphens. Yeah, that's very flattering. Uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, no, it's, I've always aspired to be wicked underground. And, um, if I, if I can be, if I can be a cult object, then I can die happy, I guess. But that, that's very sweet. <laughs> but that, I mean, all of that then led me to think I do have to talk to this guy at some point. Um, so I'm very glad that you're here. Uh, as, as I said, improv is how I've, a lot of people have brought you up. I've seen different improv that you've done. You're in an actual play show. Um, and, and that's really what brought me to, well, b- well, what brought me to role playing games was just friends of mine I knew through comedy um, inviting me to a game, which is where I met the the little cadre of people that that started stream of blood and then when pandemic hit i'm sure this is the way it's been for a lot of people where um suddenly getting together on stream was like kind of one of our only ways to have a a, a collaborative creative outlet right um so i found myself going going mad not being able to um perform because like right before right like right before um the 
pandemic hit like mid March, um, I was literally doing, I was doing a run of shows in, in Denver with improvised Shakespeare company where we were doing like eight shows a week. Oh wow. And we were just like gunning through that schedule. And then like going from doing, doing, a like a 90 minute show, um, six days a week to doing none ever <laughs> made my, made, uh, made my, made my brain cave in and also made me realize like I had to really do some, a hard look at myself. It's like, Oh man, how much of my, how much of my own sense of self-worth am I drawing from the, the, the approval of strangers. Right. And, uh, but like just, just having that creative outlet shut off was, was like, Oh, that's such a bummer. And then when, when Jared and Clint, um, pitched the idea of the streaming thing and, and were kind enough to invite me, it became a real, a real godsend. And it's been so, so fun to see it grow and develop over the course of the last year. Yeah. It's, it's been as a, as a fan of the show. Um, and, and I say the show, uh, you guys produce and are constantly producing new and different games and like one shots and all this stuff. So it's been fun to, to see that spread. And it's, it's kind of funny hearing you talk about, you know, going from doing eight shows a week, um, you know, with improv Shakespeare to, to then doing this stream, because it seems like you on any given week, you might be in an equivalent number of, of, of live streams. <laughs> there have been those weeks where yeah. I'm like, I, I hope Who my am presence I today? isn't trying your patience. <laughs> Here he is again. But, um, uh, yeah, no, it's, I mean, my favorite part of my favorite part of, uh, improv is just getting to getting to do, uh, all sorts of different characters within with sometimes within the same show. And so it's, the, the character creation process and doing characters in these shows is such a fun thing. And it's such a, it's such a, just a unique and interesting way of approaching the concept of a character, um, coming at it from any other, any other discipline. It's not quite the way a writer does. It's not quite the way an actor does. It's the, the, the weird sort of like bookkeeping that you do when you create a character is its own, is its own thing. But then when it kind of comes to life in the play, it's like, it, it takes on a life of its own in this very cool way. What is it specifically about improv that drew you to it initially or, or that kind of like keeps you going or, or that is the spark for your love for it, if you will? I mean, I, I feel like for most people, I mean, yeah, the pat answer is like, I just like storytelling. I like the community. It's like, I, I mean, you know, I feel like most people get into it because there are, they are on some level a ham <laughs> and, right. and, and, uh, I, I'm certainly no different. But in, in college, I, um, I just met some friends who'd, who'd done it in high school and I, and I had not, and they kind of introduced me to it. And my, my focus in, in college, like slowly shifted away from, (laughs) from, uh, from academics and toward like, I'm going to move to Chicago to try to do this. Um, this is the thing I love more than, and and it, and it was just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just so much fun. Um, and, uh that little, that little taste just made it my drug of choice. And I, and I went off to, to Chicago to, to try to immerse myself in it. And so were you a part of second city in Chicago? Um, yeah. Uh, after, after a bit, like, um, like I moved there and took classes at a theater that, that used to be called improv Olympic, then changed its name to IO because the international Olympic committee, uh, served them with a cease and desist. <laughs> And um, not a bad very group to get a about that from. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty legitimate, you know, group to be yeah. called out by. Yeah. Very prestigious, very litigious. And, um, the, uh, but that unfortunately, um, 2020 and, the uh, and the shutdown of theaters may have, may have made IO, um, fall by the wayside. But, um, but that was where I and the sort of cohort of, um, uh, improvisers that I, that I knew in Chicago kind of came up and then, um, and then I auditioned for second city and, and then re auditioned for second city and then started to, uh, and then, and then got in and started to, started to do stuff there. And, and, uh, and I worked on a, <laughs> I did shows on a cruise ship and then, uh, with them. And then I, and then I joined the touring company and, and then I, uh, and then I was on, was one of the resident stages, the main stage for a year before I moved to LA. That's really cool. That's a, that's a fun arc, if you will, yeah. of, of like going through that what what is what is auditioning for um i mean second city or or any like improv troupe like what what does that look like because when you know when i audition for plays i know i have a script and go do the performance but uh i've never formally done improv so i'm kind of curious how that process plays out i guess different places do it in different ways with second city you because second city is a does do a lot of 
improvisation and it's known as known for improvisation, but it is a sketch um, theater. Sure. And, and it's sort of process is taking, um, taking the improvisation and then using it as a writing tool to create, to create sketches. Um, but there's a lot of improvised performance pieces in any given second city show. So the, the uh, audition looked like, honestly, it was a lot of playing kind of whose line is it anyway, style games. Sure. And then, uh, and, and then you would do um, almost like a play audition. You'd basically get handed um, scripts of sketches from the archive um, at second city and you'd kind of cold read them and then perform them, um, for the, for the producers. So you, you, yeah. So you'd be doing like, um, like freeze or blind line and then going out into the, uh, uh, lobby and then getting handed a script where the characters' names are like Colbert and, and Carell, and then going back in and, and, uh, doing the, doing the sketch. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's, uh, is that intimidating? Like, like when you're like, Oh, this is, this is, this is what a uh, Colbert did. Um, I'll just try and do it better than he did. Oh yeah. There's no, you, 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 you realize that's, that's impossible. Right. You can only put your own, you can only, <laughs> only hope to put your own, uh, right. uh, pale shadow of a spin on it, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's both intimidating, but it's also so cool. Cause you're, you're like, I mean, there's so much, if you're a comedy nerd, there's so much like, uh, reverence for good or ill associated sure. with that space where you're just like, wow, just, you're just, so in awe of everyone who's gone through um, that, yeah, you can, you can either be like very inspired or very hamstrung by that. And o- only one of those two, there's not a happy middle ground. It's just yeah. pure inspiration or a uh, yeah. disadvantage. You're always vacillating between the two. Right. But yeah, it, it was, it, yeah, I, I, it was fun. Like the, it was, and it was the thing where like the first time I did it, like I was like sweating bullets. I was so, so nervous. And then a year passed where I just did a ton, a ton, a ton of shows. And then, so that by the time, like it came around again, I was, I was just a little more, just a little more relaxed where I could actually have fun with it. And, yeah. and which is pro- the way it is, I think for almost any, any audition is where you can kind of work yourself to the point that you're where you're nervous, but still, um, willing to like, I'm going to get as much fun out of this as I can for its own sake. And then like leave the nerves at the door as best I can. Yeah. Muscle memory, essentially. Like you've done it enough that you, you know, you've confidence in your own capabilities and you've kind of been there before. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we, I always like with improvisation, if people are like, how do you rehearse or how do you, how do you get used to it? Like it's a, the sports metaphor is like pretty useful. It's like you rehearse, not like, not like a play, but you practice like a basketball team where it's like, you never play the same game of basketball twice, but there are like fundamental skills that'll ensure that you play a better game of basketball with that team each time. Right. And so like the, the reps just improve those. And then, then when you step in, you're just less intimidated by, by the, it could, anything could happen. You're, you're, that's the fun part. Right. Right. That's the fun part. You know, you know, kind of the guidelines behind the scenes and the, the kind of strictures and process that allow you to get to the fun part of it. Yeah. What, what do you think, pandemic aside, because that's kind of the big, like, you know, shake up in, in any conversation like this, but what, what do you think the state of, like, improv, um, sketch comedy, like, if you will, is right now? And, and I ask that because I remember growing up, um, you know, my only exposure to improv was Whose Line Is It Anyway, right? And I had no idea that that was actually a thing you could go do. I was just like, oh... Uh, Drew Carey and, and, you know, Ryan mock Colin mockery and Ryan saw they get to do that. And I get to watch them. And that's the only place that exists. And it wasn't until like college or later that I found out you could actually go and do improv and go do performance. And then now, you know, like the, the term, everyone and their mom ch- throws out the term. Yes. And, and I feel like yeah, it's become like a cultural cliche. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm curious and obviously, uh, you know, middle edition shorts was a big Netflix success with, um, with their show. And so I'm just kind of curious, like as somebody who does this or is more in that community, do you feel like it's on the rise or more kind of in the cultural zeitgeist or, or where do you think it is right now? Yeah. I, um, I don't know about rise. Like, I feel like, I feel like now people are more aware of what it sure, is yeah. kind of beyond, beyond the, the who's line of it all. Um, and also for, for good or ill, now I feel like so many people know somebody who's taken improv classes. <laughs> and so you, so yeah, so it's either like, hey, the funniest person I know is taking improv class, and it's fun, and they're having such a great time, or it's like, uh, 
uh, the weirdest, most problematic person I know is taking improv classes. <laughs> and and that, that's my window onto what improv is. Right. But um, so because it's more common, it now, it's now it, it, it's demystified somewhat. And uh, which which is good. And um, the, as far as how the pandemic has affected it, like people are kind of scrambling to figure out how to make all live theater experiences work. The people who are set up for a lot of success were people who are who I feel like there's a lot of improv comedy podcasts mm-hmm. probably thrived during this time. Like uh, um, I know like Hello from the Magic Tavern, sure. which was produced by some uh, like buddies of mine in Chicago, which was like chock full of great uh, Chicago improvisers or like um, uh, off book, which is probably um, um, like Zach Reno, who's done stuff on the stream of blood and, and his comedy partner, the uh, Jess McKenna are two of the most brilliant musical improvisers ever. And they, that's, those are two plugs I'll, I'll put out there. If anybody is starved for, for, uh, for improv content, but I, having done a few like improv shows over like zoom or stream, like it's hard. It it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun, but it's, it's not the same. Um, just the lag of it and the, the lack of intimacy doesn't make it, doesn't make it quite the same. And the big X factor is of course, you don't hear those sweet, sweet laughs, Andrew. I don't get to get that sweet hit baby right. of what I need. What, what you're really there for. You're not, you're not getting it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's weird, but um, it's, it's slowly but surely starting to creep back. One interesting thing that's happened is like I said, like IO has gone away. One of the two um, upright citizen brigade theaters here in LA closed so now there's yeah. there's one there there used to be two and so the institutions that that propped up improvisation are are weakened and i think there's there's that's bad in that like there's those institutions aren't there for you to perform at there's also a lot of opportunity now because um the community now has kind of a chance to like kind of rebuild in, improvisation in a, in a in a in a better way, because like a lot of cultural institutions, improv itself was going through its own kind of reckoning over the past couple of years with like full of problems of like representation and, and, uh, and just like, like any institution will, um, uh, occasionally hide or prop up kind of t- toxic figures. Sure. That that's, that's, I, and that's not unique to improvisation. That's, that's any cultural institution of any kind. And, I think maybe the unmaking of some of these institutions by the pandemic has a chance for them to be remade uh, better and more equitably. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's true for a lot of areas. And I, I think that that is like a, uh, admirable is not the right word, but I, th- I think that's like the right mindset to have about it. Um, because in lots of ways, especially in performance and uh, in acting and production, those older institutions are, while they're great enablers for the people who can get into them, you know, as far as like, career building, if you will, they're also very big gatekeepers in ways, right? Like, oh, well, you're only going to ride on the show if you came from this, you know, company or whatever, right? And so perhaps the uh, democratizing of that or the, or the spreading of that, you know, thanks to the internet and blah, blah, blah. I, I feel so old. I just said the phrase, thanks to the internet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, seems, that seems like a good thing. Like you're saying, there's, there's you potential. Ever, like, so surf spread. the net? Um, have, you, have you been on the Netscape? Yeah. yeah. Look, Andrew, when I jack into the mainframe, I'm kind of a console cowboy. So when I uh, just neuromance my way in there, um, I find, yeah, a democratic space where, 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 where I can, only good I can things happen and no one's voice is amplified and it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All these things are, are, are a mixed blessing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, yeah, the Internet of everything makes makes like I think we're in a moment where like self starters will will really we're real. We'll, will really thrive. Yeah. What, uh, what would you say to people who are interested in improv, um, and are constrained by the pandemic or don't live in a city like Chicago or LA that is kind of known for its performance? What would you say, uh, to a 30 something white dude in Houston, Texas, who, you know, a random, a random selection, a totally some hypothetical, random person, yeah, hundred percent. Who's ever heard of this person? Uh, what would you say yeah. to a person like that? Who, who is interested in, you know, getting into th- getting into improv and pursuing it. Like are online classes the right way? Do you read books? Do you talk in a mirror? Uh, what would you tell this pretend fellow? Yeah. I would tell this hypothetical person. Yeah. Definitely talk to yourself in the mirror. Uh, that's, that's, that's definitely the way to go. It will not make you spiral off into, into madness. No um, risk. Yeah. Um, the, it does. The void does not stare back. Um, but, uh, no, I would say that like pretty much everything you listed is good. Um, I have not, 
I've, I've done, a, actually, that's not true. I've, I've taught some like online workshops over the course of pandemic, which were really fun. And even though it's not the same as being in the same room together, it's what we got. And if people are game to accept it for the constraints that it presents, then, then it's, then it's still very fun. And I think you can still get a lot out of it. Um, and yeah, read, go ahead and read books. If you, um, and not, and I would say not just in, improv and comedy books, <laughs> like there are one or two that I'd maybe recommend, uh, I don't know, like a, one off the top of my head, if, if you're interested in improvisation, I love, uh, I think it's called improvise from the, this is the scene from inside out. The, the author's name is Mick Napier. If I, if I recommend a single improv book, that's the one, the one by Mick Napier. Um, but aside from that, if you just stay culturally engaged, that's the most important is that you have a sense of like, um, is that words come, <laughs> come to you, uh, um, that you're, that you're aware of current events and, and culture at, at large is, is super duper helpful. And, and just like, I think staying engaged in fiction and culture increases your, your base level of empathy and which is very helpful. And when you're dealing with an extremely collaborative thing, like improvisation, where so much of it when it's at its best is about making the people that you're working with look their best. Does that come into your mind at all when, when you are performing um, specifically the, the audience and like delivering something to them versus just simply, you know, creating a great scene with your partner. And, and I, I mean that because, you know, you mentioned staying culturally relevant. So how often, like, is it a conscious thing of like, Oh, you know, I'm going to mention Bernie in a chair this week, or is it just kind of like, that you're, you've inundated yourself with like stuff that's going on and that is entertaining to you. So you can work that in and you know, it's going to land or is there kind of more intention there? I think it maybe you want to know because you want to, I, I feel like you don't want to get stumped. Um, or, or just, I mean, it's, it's inevitably going to happen that you'll get like the random suggestion where you turn to the person next to you and you're like, who is Jojo Siwa? Like, um, but, uh, that's that's just kind of just so you just so you've got the stuff up in your up in your head. Yeah, you never want to pander to the audience. But one of the fun things about improvisation is that you are kind of always engaged in a, in a dialogue with the audience um, when you're performing, and y what they respond to guides you as far as like, ooh, this is delightful to the audience, and provided that it's also delightful to us, this is the thing that we can continue to explore. Um, like, like, I feel like the audience at the end of a show, and I say this as when I watch shows, you walk out like with your brain feeling a little fried, like you, like you were an active part, even though you didn't say anything, like you're, you're still like connecting, connecting dots as an yeah. audience member um, and engaged with it more fully. That makes total sense. Let's take a quick second here to give a shout out to another sponsor on the show, because uh, that is how the show happens. And if I don't shout them out, then they don't sponsor the show. But more than that, I love to because they're fantastic people and they're the people at Die Hard Dice. Um, you guys hear me talk about them a lot because they are just a, a wonderful crew of, of be truly beautiful people uh, in the community running a small business providing uh, the ever important um, shiny math rocks that we all know and love and need. Uh, but they do it in beautiful ways. Um, they have some, some fantastic right now it's pride month when we're recording this, when you hear it, it will no longer be pride month, but you can still have pride, uh, cause they have some fantastic dice and proceeds from that go to benefit people in the community. Um, but they're just, there's great people. I love working with them. So go to dieharddice.com, check them out. If you want a discount, use the code roll and then whatever month it is when you're doing your order. So if you're, if you're placing an order in October, the code is roll October, just go for it. It's easy. You save a little money and you support the show, but more importantly, you support good people in the community making some really cool shit for you to have fun with at your table. So check them out. Dieharddice.com. Hopefully they don't listen to my very off the cuff ad reads and decide to pull that sponsorship. Um, cause that would be a bummer, but I don't think that'll happen because they're fantastic. Check them out. We appreciate their support. Let's pivot. Um, oh yeah. Oh no, 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 no. Now I know I feel like I spoke over what was going to be a truly oh, fantastic yeah. moment of the show. And I regret everything. Oh no, I was just saying that like, yeah, you're, you're off the cuff, shoot from the hip, ad read, just, just, it's the voice of a, it's the voice of a trusted friend. This is what our products and services want. It's, it's what the people crave and it's what I give them. That is the goal. It's only ever gone <laughs> sideways half the time. So I figured that's a good, that's a good ratio to have one for two. Um, it's not a shift because it's storytelling, it's performing, it's whatever, but but when did uh, when did role playing games become a thing that you got into? 
it really was like three years ago. Um, just, just through my friends, like, uh, I think one of them was just like, you would like this. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know what he saw in me. Sure. Um, what, uh, <laughs> cause as I said, I'm a brutish jock alpha and <laughs> but he was like, you've ripped um, three shirts during this conversation. It felt excessive, but also impressive. Yeah. I got to stop getting these double XSs. Um, they barely make it over my enormous pecs, but, um, I, uh, yeah, um, they just pulled me in and, um, and I was like hooked right away. I, I, uh, I, I, I think I would just been on a kick of like, I'm not a big video games person. Like I'm not a gamer in that way. Like I, I basically haven't played a video game that was made after 1997. <laughs> like, uh, um, but I, I did get a, a mod on my, on my laptop to play final fantasy. Is it three or six? Whatever the one is with like, I get mixed up. The numbering is different in Japan. Cause yeah, the, the Japanese and, release yeah. is different. Yeah. In any case, like it's like, it's the classic, um, uh, Super Nintendo. Oh, okay. Final yeah. Fantasy. I know which one you're talking about. And I was like, I like got tunnel vision obsessed with it. And so that, that's kind of what, that's kind of what made turn-based role-playing coherent to me is like, well, since I did that and then they pulled me in and I think the first game we played was like a GURPS mm -hmm. game and then uh call of Cthulhu and then uh Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, Oh man. Yeah. Hook, line and sinker. Does it scratch in some ways the same itch as performing for you? Or is it uh, the collaborative storytelling element? Yeah, I think it's both. It's, uh, yeah, it's the, the collaborative storytelling, the like building on one another's ideas, the, the like you can kind of do anything and go anywhere of it. And the fun of like building a, an interesting uh, character in, a, in an interesting, cool world. And when you're in the, in the practiced hands of people like, like, uh, Jared Logan, who's like just a master at what, at whatever the skill of like game mastering is, he is worthy of that title. Cause he's truly just a master of it, of like, of keeping a story going, of playing the characters of like having a sense of pace and drama of, of ending things with like really tantalizing cliffhangers and, uh, presenting you with like really brain wrecking moral quandaries and also and while at the same time knowing the rules making it easy for a newcomer and kind of like organizing play in such a way that it teaches you how to do it like i kind of i'm kind of it kind of blows my mind when i look back and see all the balls he juggles um so he kind of taught me how to do it along with the other people at the table um, but it does scratch those itches like and and, and sort of kind of circle back to your previous question if if in the age of of zoom you find yourself starved for improvisation like role-playing games do get let you scratch the itch a little bit it certainly has for me over the past year you mentioned uh you know jared kind of like teaching teaching you had you played uh had you played vampire before before you did vampires of pittsburgh and i asked because the the vibe is was very much that you guys were in many ways kind of learning as you went but it was done in such a and maybe i was wrong about that but it was done in such a well handled way it really kind of felt like the audience was learning along with you yeah i um i think that was super impressive the way he kind of made those first few sessions almost like a tutorial both for us and the audience um i was aware of vampire the masquerade just because as a as a gothy youth like i was ambiently aware of its existence but i also had a, a roommate in college who had that the old source book the one with like the cover with like the rose on it it looks oh, like yeah. the cover of of uh, ministries with sympathy. And I remember uh, like just pouring over that um, and being like, wow, this, this looks intense <laughs> and also kind of, and so intense that it was a little bit funny um, and, uh, and which it is. And um, so I kind of, I did have a sort of a sense of the world rattling around in my head, but that was about it. Um, uh, yeah. So I was a total newbie. As, as you played but, and you got, you guys have done, I don't even know how many episodes at this point you're on your second like season, I guess, if you will, with, yeah, like lockdown. It's a lot. Um, what have you, uh, 70, I don't know. It's been, it's been yeah. a lot of episodes. What have you, if anything, kind of, as you've been playing discovered about the world or the game system or the, like, the world of vampires and evil. Um, it's uh, what's blown can, your mind about it. Yeah. What's blown my mind about like, well, we kind of touched, we touched base on those on like, the the game I played the most before this was uh, Dungeons and Dragons, which I which is the kind of the the gateway drug for most people probably, and and that is so built around like combat, 
mm-hmm. like it is kind of like a combat simulator but the, the role playing is 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 a big part of it but it's mostly built around like the the um the combat in encounters to use the, their lingo um that i was really surprised with like vampire the masquerade is very like theatery like it's all yeah. like and, and i think they even refer to it almost as like social combat like so much of it is 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 manipulation and figuring out people's motives and using their secrets against them and it's very soap operatic um and so it is very act actorly that which kind of surprised me and what also surprised me in a very cool way is that i think something that's both fun and maybe problematic about a lot of role-playing games is that they are um power fantasies which are valuable and that they let you play out um uh they they let you play out these things that maybe are, are repressed within you or you want to just kind of explore but i think indulging too much in escapist power fantasy is maybe a little toxic sure. um it's like when i would watch anime and i like like <laughs> like i don't know if you know the anime sword art online like i, uh, I know it I, exists sure yeah yeah it's um it's based i think there's a lot of shows like this it's it's what if you were trapped in an in an mmorpg and had to fight your way out and our hero is a guy who's just like super great at swords and is and and i just described his character he's basically <laughs> like just an audience surrogate who is yeah. like he's a badass who's good at everything and um and at a certain point and i was really compelled by it at the beginning but at a certain point i'm like i don't who is the who is this guy <laughs> like, yeah um but with vampire like you're kind of coaxed in with the idea like ooh, i get to be this badass like sexy powerful vampire but what you realize a few sessions in is is it's like oh no this is a this is a a horror game and it's not just because horrible things happen it's because you are const- your character is constantly losing grip on on everything that made them human all their ethics and morals their very soul just kind of begins to slip away the more they engage in the power fantasy of it it's like if you want to to live the power fantasy of it you've got to give up um everything that would maybe enjoy that and and it's yeah it's 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 a really complex and mature not just because it is uh it involves like you know sex and violence but mature and that like the the kind of moral quandaries it's always putting you in i i watched a lot of the show snowfall over a pandemic which is about the the kind of a fictionalized rise depiction of the rise of the crack epidemic okay. in los angeles and so it's sort of the rise of a street level drug kingpin. And as he rises in power, he also loses his soul. And, and, and the, as the world and the community begins to, to rot and become overwhelmed with systemic violence. And to me, it's like snowfall is, is weirdly one of the things that I compare vampire to most in the way that you track this character's arc as they, as they, they gain the world, but lose their soul. Yeah. I, I think in, in apologies to listeners who hear me rave about vampire too much. Um, I, I love it for so many reasons. And it's funny, I actually had never played it until you guys started doing stream of blood. Cause I think I started listening after your first episode and I was like, I need to play this game. And I've now been able to play it a bunch in a few different areas. But um, I I'm surprised constantly, especially given how like dense and incomprehensible the source book is um, how the mechanics do exactly what you're talking about in such a, a nuanced and beautiful way that, that they, they almost get out of the way and then put you into those situations, whether it's rolling hunger dice, whether it's your hunger mm-hmm. increasing stains, right? Like the, the idea of a touchstone or, or different things to make sure that you are in a constant state of like moral pull and, um, you know, having to constantly weigh all decisions like cost and benefit, uh, in a, you know, in a, in a moral resource management way versus like spell slots and key points and like, like, uh, how many more times can I punch? It's like, how many more times can I, you know, eat someone without like losing my shit completely and becoming evil or anything? Yeah. Like yeah. That? And like, how long can I still c- convince myself that I'm on, that I'm on a, on a virtuous mission of vengeance as my, as the body count continues to rise. <laughs> right. Like, like uh, we, we played a session where we're recording this on a, on a Monday. We, we played a session on Sunday morning and, um, uh, the character that I play indulged in one of the most like psychotic pieces of violence that, that this character has ever done. And it's like, and, uh, 
and I, I really, I like, we got off stream and I was like, I was like kind of shaken. I was like, wow, that was like really, that was, that was twisted and evil. And it, and I felt like not in the sort of like grandiose, like wicked twisted. It was like, oh my God, like there's no coming back from this. Like it was really, it really shook me. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too, or maybe it's good or beneficial that like the vampire community as, as I've gotten to know people who play this game more like the idea of like aftercare and, and all this stuff is actually a big part for people who play this game constantly because stuff like that does happen where you like are playing the game in a very intense and deep way. And the, the evil or the, you know, the violence is very grounded. It's not shooting fire at a dragon. It is like personal and gritty and like could be happening next door kind of thing. And so right. this whole yeah. system you- of care has grown up around it. Yeah. I didn't know that that was a thing, but it totally makes sense. Like I, I hadn't realized this until I got into RPGs and began to like, occasionally engage with like forums or things but the whole concept of the D murder hobo where your where your your D party just goes from town to town gaining xp by just slaughtering people and it's like oh, well on to the next um and never having to engage with that with the fact that like almost all the creatures that you encounter are like sentient <laughs> like um uh or, or or have a maybe have a conscience um like vampire always makes you make that choice and because you're in a world where that is basically just the contemporary world you don't really you're not and it's not being mediated by like i have a halberd and a magical fireball it's like yeah i can jump really far and i drink blood but like the person i'm doing that to is just a guy who works at 7-eleven yeah. so i'm like should i really mess up their day by <laughs> by bending them to my will have right. they been through enough that brings me back what you were just saying to your point about Jared. And, and I think this is a compliment for anyone who is a good like game master or storyteller or vampire, or whatever game is when a game, uh, whatever system it is, vampire relies on, you know, this kind of like moral pressure or, or whatever system it might be um, playing with a good game master who brings that back and keeps that at the forefront and recognizes how crucial an element of the game that is that that can change your whole experience playing because they'll keep that in front of you and they'll keep it's it as a carrot in a stick kind of thing. It definitely he's he he will let you indulge in 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 the things that a vampire does the things that you got into the game for he'll let you swoop around and be be a be the monster of the night, but then like when it comes time to turn on the guilt, Jared is amazing at like finding your character's pressure point and and going right at it, and and I really like I feel like I'm focusing on Jared and he's and as I should, because he's amazing and runs an amazing game. But like Abu Bakar Salim and, and Ashley Birch, who also play in the game, are just like such incredible actors that like, that their ability to just like, in the bizarre constraints of like a streaming setting, are able to just like focus up on these characters in such a compelling way and play them with such emotional integrity that it makes everyone else step their game up and it makes it so much darker and more intense. Would you ever want to, um, or, or do you hope that y'all will ever be able to do like a live game, a live performance, not just in person with each other, but for an active audience? I, I would love it. Oh my God. Yeah. I've never been to a convention or anything. Like if, if that in the, in the world of the future where like, um, where that stuff is an option, I would love to do it. Like Ashley and I, I think have been in the same room like once I've never, I've never been in the same room with Abu. Like it's crazy that I've spent hours upon hours with these people creating helping like telling this tale and we and we've never hung out <laughs> like, it's crazy it, it's the weird pandemic reality i know i now tell people through this show and stuff that i do uh in streaming games and and performing in, in actual plays is like i have i mean i have, I have friends of course <laughs> i have friends they're real are you okay man you i've got shaking. i've got so many friends they're so um real to me uh but i have i have a lot now that are fogging up are buddy. online only that's because mm-hmm. I'm wearing my mask even at home because I'm that committed to uh, the health and security. Um, but, <laughs> but I now have so many friends that I'm like, oh, yeah, these are legitimate friends. I interact with them on a weekly, if not daily basis. And then I'm like, holy shit, I have never met this person outside yeah. of screen. I don't know how tall they are. I don't know what it's like to like hug them or shake their hand. But, you know, that it, it's it's a weird relationships that the pandem- pandemic has like allowed slash forced us to. Uh, create it's it's very interesting and i think it will be very shocking to finally meet some of these people face to face and have those yeah. relationships move you know to a to a closer place i guess i know I'm, I'm 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 excited to do it i'm excited for people to to be shocked at how tall i am um 
<laughs> not not that I'm some gargantuan dude. Um, but there is actually some some a trade off that I kind of like about it in that it being on the on a stream like this or in in a Zoom or whatever in a home game like it makes it so much more it puts so much more pressure on your imagination. Um, I kind of I as much as I. I all respect to your sponsors. Feel free to cut this out. I like as much as I enjoy like miniatures and game environments and that kind of stuff. Like, like one of the, the thing that I maybe like most about role playing games or that I discovered I like most about them is that the way it, the way they just incept into your brain mm. and how the memory of them is almost as real as your real memory. Like, like when I remember things that happen in a game, I don't remember a grid of faces. I remember the alleyway yeah. where I was confronted by uh, the Archon, <laughs> like you know, um, and and I also just love the low the low material buy in of it. That all you much like improvisation, all you need are some friends and a space. With an RPG, all you need like is that 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 rule book. You don't even need a dice if you've got like um, like a virtual dice on your phone or whatever, um, and an imagination, and you go. Yeah. And, and the barriers, you know, I was half complaining about the pandemic and how it's made relationships weird. It actually, it enables, it has enabled, uh, you know, you to play or interact with people that you probably would not normally either because we would all be busier with our normal jobs or geographical barriers. Um, those have kind of dropped to a certain degree and, and allowed collaboration that might not have been possible previously. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of pandemic content, because I did legit make a note because I did not want to forget this. You are the creator of one of my favorite pieces of pandemic content. Um, you made a little music video called Stores at some point <laughs> midsummer last year, which yeah. is, is probably the goofiest thing for me to be a fan of. But, uh, but it cracks me up. I think it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Um, oh, so so thank you. Thank you for making that. But um, what led you to do you often make, you know, uh, uh, amusing rap music videos in your day-to-day life or was that just like a I'm so fucking bored i need to go create something i need to it was a combination of both i mean i've 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 made i've made music videos and stuff but i and i also have done a, a fair amount of musical improvisation like a ton a ton and so you just feel those things kind of atrophying and you're like you want to do something but also also just the inspiration of like the frustration of mid-year being like seeing people aggressively resistant to just paying a, a cursory acknowledgement of like the public good. Right. And, and it's like, and it was like, for what, like you're going to put you and so many people at risk because you want to go to bed, bath and beyond like, okay. <laughs> I, 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 and, and f- sometimes you have to like, but, but, Sure. But at least I'm not not saying that, but um, it was more more the like just riffing on the entitlement that you would see yeah. in, in people. Um, if I want to go to Bass Pro Shop, I should be allowed to go to Bass Pro Shop. Damn yeah, it, this and you is should be allowed to take your mask off and scream at the cashier. Um, that's your right. That's in the Constitution. Pretty um, sure Washington wouldn't have put it there if he didn't want us to do it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, Oops, yeah, check out stores. I yeah, think it's okay. on. I think it's on YouTube, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, it, it's funny. The mu- and, and, and I say this uh, not just because it's funny, but like the music's good. Like the the, the oh, song and you. the lyrics that you put together and the beat, um, it's really catchy. And so Thanks, you know, dude. I appreciate it as a as a full you know arts and entertainment experience. Perhaps there should be some more stuff coming out soon. But yeah, I because because the the topicality of that one, I hope, will go away. Sure, um, but the. Uh, but yeah, uh, that, 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 I made that music and, uh, my, my fiance is a, is an amazing, um, video director and editor and writer, and she shot it and made it look way better than it had any business being. That's, that's always great to, uh, to, to be with someone who has complimentary and helpful skills. Um, yes. you know, not just in life, but like, oh, cool. I want to do a thing and you can make that easier for me. Come on. Yeah. Truly blessed. Hashtag blessed. Too blessed to be stressed. Too Ooh. to be disappointed. Live, laugh, love, baby. It's one o'clock somewhere. Oh. I'm I'm out. That's all I got. <laughs> was my live laugh love was the only uh, was the only white suburban joke I had. Only only like piece of uh, d- driftwood art from Pier One. I, I haven't I haven't been out in public enough to kind of find out what people are putting up temporary wall tattoos of these days. 
So yeah. I look forward to that. Um, so, so you're playing these games, uh, and we'll link to all of that in the show notes, but, but what other stuff are you doing? Like, where can people find you if they want to check out, uh, you and your content, you draw, you, you have a really cool art style that I really dig. Oh. Um, so, so where can people go and find Ross online? I feel like the best clearing house for all that is my Instagram. I, 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 I almost like it's Instagram. <laughs> Uh, give your money to Zuckerberg, but right. it isn't, but it's Instagram. Hit me, please follow my Instagram. <laughs> Get me to 10,000, please. Um, hit that I, like uh, and follow button. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I post, I post cartoons and stuff. And if I make something, I'll put it up there, link to it. So that's, that's the best spot. So my Instagram is at Ross BB. If you want to follow me, but yeah, I'd, I'd be popping up. And if you're in LA, um, uh, Improvised Shakespeare Company is going to be doing our first show in over a year at the Ford Amphitheater at the end of July. So that's very exciting. Check that sucker out. I've actually been to that theater and I like it very much. So oh, I will. That's the only connection I have to what you just said. But uh, <laughs> but actually, oh, no, I might be. Well, wait, hold on. When did you say it's happening? I, I want to say. See, it's important, Andrew, when you when you do a plug to actually know the date. That's that's a cool thing you should have. Allegedly, you want to give the audience a sense of mystery, though, right? Yeah. I want to, I want to make this a fun treasure hunt for you audience. Just go on Google and see if you can figure it out. Um, I, I want to say it's July 31st. Okay. So, so like late July, cause I will be in LA at some point. I used to go to LA all the time and the world burned and I got a different job, but, uh, which is a shame cause now I know all these people in LA doing cool things and I don't go there. Anymore. But, uh, yeah, if you are in LA and you're listening to this, um, go on Wikipedia and somewhere in, uh, the articles Ross has hidden the date and location of his show. I gave you all the clues, Mr. Police. Yeah. Um, yeah. Find us. I believe it's the 31st of July. If you're in LA, check it out. And Oh, and on, on the, I think this is coming out in July, but we put out stuff on the stream of blood on, on, uh, on VOD on, on YouTube. And I will be dungeon mastering oh. on this, on the stream next week will be my first time doing dungeon mastering on the stream. Running is only my running. It's only the second game I've ever run. Um, no, I, I will be truly dungeon. Truly mastering. dungeon. Mastering. This will be this will be dungeons. Get this. Hold on, just dungeons. No, and dragons, both of them, dungeons and dragons. Which edition? Fifth edition. The most common one. Yes, um, that one. Uh, I'll be I'll be dungeon mastering a fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons game. Um, next. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, when this comes when out, this I comes will out, have yeah. done it. Time, so, time is strange. So if you haven't already seen it, go go on the, the Stream of Blood YouTube and find it because I'm, I'm doing it with three of my friends, um, one of whom uh, is a, is a, is a uh, practiced uh, Dungeons & Dragons player, but the other two are, are uh, newbies to it. So I'm, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be the RPG evangelist to my, uh, to my improviser friends to see if I can make them catch the fever as I have. And you're putting them on stream. So you're requiring that they at least show up and perform and like exactly. have fun that way. So you're, you, that's kind of, that's a clever way to do it. Actually props to you. You got to put the screws to them. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I've tant- I've baited the hook with the thing that no performer can resist a, a an audience. An audience. To- oh. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I think recently uh, y'all just released merch for stream of blood. Some of which I features your art. If I recall, yeah. uh- one or two things have, yeah. have, have some of my artwork on it, um, but most of it is by Will Potorf, mm. who uh, does a ton of the in-game art for the Stream of Blood and is just like a low-key genius, um, like comic book level art of His stuff the is characters super good. and situations of the, in, these, in these streams. He's extremely impressive. And, and also uh, 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 Jill, who, who does the, the graphic design, like, there's great stuff on there. If you want to, if you want a shirt with a gnarly ass vampire on it, go to streamofblood.com and check it out. It'll be pretty cool. Well, we'll put links to all of that in the show notes. So you guys can check it out um, where you can find Ross, where you can find uh, the dates for the mystery show happening sometime in July. Uh, and so you can definitely <laughs> check that out. And of course it's art and Instagram and YouTube and all the fun stuff. We'll link it. You can go find it. It's easy. Um, anything else, man, I really appreciate you coming on. This was fun. It kind of flew by. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's all I got. Unless you got anything. That yeah, feels no, like that such was, a that was real fun. That's such a mean question to ask as an interviewer. Cause somebody's just given like a long, like, Oh, and here are different things. And you're like, yeah, anything else? And they're like, no motherfucker. I just um, told you. Um, geez. Uh, now that you know, mention it. Like, yeah. Uh, read the power broker by Robert Caro. Uh, <laughs> I listened to that audio book this year and it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> um, uh, duly noted. 
But cool. Well, thank thank you guys for listening. And uh, and of course, you guys know, hopefully, unless you're new, in which case you find out right now, that if you support this show at patreon.com slash roll for persuasion, you get access to the Zone of Truth, which is the bonus segment after each and every Roll for Persuasion episode where I chat with my guests about whatever we come up with on the fly. I usually ask them, what are you into? What are your hobbies? What do you love? What can you talk about while I sit and listen? Which is the secret to a great interview show, by the way. But if you go to patreon.com slash roll for persuasion, you get access to all those bonus episodes, not just new ones, but the whole back library. So you can go and have a blast listening to all that. Um, and today, Ross, I, I think you said you might be able to give me a couple options, a, a veritable menu, if you will. Um, <laughs> yeah. To, oh, to before choose that, from. I, I have to shout out Mark Arcusha, who who uh, who re- referenced my uh, my buddy from high school, who I never got to play RPGs with back when we were in high school. And now we're both doing RPG content. We gotta, we gotta unite the unite unite the clans. Did did, um, did Mark mention you when he was on my show? I listened and to I just, it. Totally promoted it, and he and he sh- and he did shout me out. So game recognized game. Mark's Mark's uh, great, and and uh, and the Cast Die podcast. His podcast is great too. Yes, see, so many people have now mentioned you on my show. I've lost track of them. Um, <laughs> so that's the kind of cool following that you have. Uh, but but so we're gonna we're gonna jump into that in just a second. What do you want to talk about? What are you uh, what are you hyper into? Oh man, I I. I, I I'm just thinking about stuff I dorked out about this year. And one of them was, one of them was Dune. Okay. One of them was, uh, uh, one of them was Wagner. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. I actually like Wagner a lot. Cool. Okay. And, uh, and just ge- general, uh, g- general music, I guess. So here's what we're going to try and do. We're going to try and hit both Wagner and Dune. Let's do it. Um, and that is the kind of, cool behind the scenes content you can get if you support the show roll for uh, patreon.com slash roll for persuasion in the zone of truth we'll be going in there in just a second um but until then guys make sure that you are following my shows uh on all the different social medias and by all of them i mean twitter at roll persuasion you can go to rollforpersuasion.com to check out some of uh my own merch to find past episodes see what's going on and of course if you listen to this podcast on the lovely and wonderful um and not difficult to get noticed on at all apple podcast podcasts then you can then you can sorry uh, sorry leave us a drop something <laughs> really blew your outro we're, we're gonna no we're gonna leave it in this is we okay. do it live baby this is a radio show uh fuck it we'll do it live it's, it's happening and you can't stop it um go to apple podcasts on your device anybody's device and leave a review for the show i don't even care if it's a bad review uh because i'd love to hear what you think um so that i can obsess over it and allow that to make me become better and or more depressed we'll see with the uh, review that you can leave at Apple Podcasts. So thank you guys so much for that support. Um, Hit me up on the socials. I love to chat with people there. And until next time, guys, enjoy your games. Enjoy your games.